All right, so I'm just gonna give an update on sort of the status of containers uh, in HPC. So I'll talk a little bit about, a um, little bit of a background on containers and why they're interesting. Talk a little bit about, it says shifter here, but it's really about containers at NERSC and some of the activities we're engaged in. Talk about a little foray into containers and reproducibility and then talk about some other related efforts kind of outside that I think are interesting and then talk about kind of future trends, future directions. Okay, so just uh, to get everybody on the same page, I, I think now containers have become pretty commonplace and people are pretty familiar with it. So at some point, I should not have to give this, just in case there's some that haven't, um, you know, had a chance to try this stuff out. I always like to just start with this. So, can you know, what the container ecosystem, especially really popularized by Docker, uh, has done is provided a simple way to kind of build, ship, and run uh, applications or services. And this originally really started out in kind of the web space where they needed to deploy applications, maybe at scale, and needed a more streamlined way of doing that. And so, uh, the current innovation that Docker provided is they took a lot of the capabilities that were already in, say, the Linux kernel, and built a tool chain around that to make this process really uh, seamless and, and productive. And so you can use uh, a recipe that I'll show an example of later to build images, then you can push those to a registry like Docker Hub or a private uh, registry, and then pull those down and run those on different uh, execution resources. So uh, you know, these, uh, a container really is just, a, it uses a combination of Linux kernel capabilities like C groups and namespaces to create these isolated environments. There's actually kind of a long history of containers, but again, it was Docker, I think, that really provided uh, the tool chain that made it work well. Uh, before that, things were a little bit cumbersome and uh, complicated. And then since that time, you've seen sort of a whole uh, ecosystem explode around containers, especially around orchestration. So we'll say a little bit about Kubernetes later on. And then we've seen that come into the HPC space uh, enabled by a number of uh, HPC container runtimes. So Shifter, which I'll describe a little bit later, um, was I think sort of the first kind of HPC centric uh, runtime, followed very closely by Singularity, both developed at LDL, which is kind of interesting. And there have been others that have appeared since then. So there's Charlie Cloud out of LANL, Soros out of CSCS, and uh, you know, there's a few others that I, I, I don't list here. So what's in a container? It's basically kind of a, you could think of it as almost like a snapshot of a, a host system. So it's got all the uh, file system tree, the, the Linux operating system, it can include, include any Linux, uh, any libraries, binaries, tools that you may need to support your application. Of course, the user code itself. It can even include data, but generally there are some kind of best practices around how big you want images to be. So a lot of times maybe that'll be separated out. It can also include things like runtime settings. So that can be things like environment variables, uh, working directory, how to execute the applications. So it's really trying to encapsulate all of the kind of relevant pieces that you need to, to run an application uh, correctly. Uh, it can also include other things that aren't as important to HPC use cases, but that can include things like network related uh, things like what ports to expose or what user to run uh, the application as. This is uh, the, the way you would typically build an image is through a Docker file. You can think of it as just like a, a simple recipe of how to construct the environment that um, and install your application to, to execute that environment. So just very briefly, the kind of components of a Docker file, these are the, there are a few other directives, but these are kind of the common ones that you need. So that's, you start with a from line that basically says, what is the base that you're gonna kind of build off of? And then there's, a, you can add uh, labels or kind of metadata to that image as well. So a common one that you do is you put the maintainer in. Um, this is more of a convention, uh, really. And then there's these two directives, run and add or copy. Both of these uh, add and copy work uh, similarly. Uh, Run basically says, inside this environment that I'm building up, do this operation. So you're basically creating 
kind of modifications or you know changes to that image to arrive at the final product. So you can run things in there to do things like install packages, for example, um, and then add or copy is used to bring things from outside the container environment into the container environment. So if you have a, a source code tree checked out on your, your local system and it had a Docker file in the base of it, this would be sort of the typical way you would take that source code and put it into the container environment so that you could uh, say build it and execute it. Uh, and really it's this run and add copy. You usually, those are the key uh, kind of verbs that you use in creating these images. And then to build it, you just use a command like below. So you do Docker build, you give it some name, uh, including uh, maybe something about where the repository that you're gonna push it to in a registry, for example, and then you would use the push command to actually push those contents up. It's, I think it was inspired by Git. So you see a lot of kind of Git uh, kind of concepts come into play in the, the command line structure of, of Docker, for example. So why are containers an interesting idea for NERSE? So I think everybody here is obviously familiar with NERSE. So I don't need to really give much background, but the key thing here is like, because of the number of users and the breadth of projects that we have to support and the growing amount of experimental and sort of observational use cases and machine learning use cases, you know, this creates a burden for us to support all of those um, variety of applications. And it's, you know, we can only, we only have so much bandwidth to be able to install and manage applications for the users. So containers really provide a way to allow them to have um, a little more flexibility in what they want to to run at NERSC and can really make them more productive. So the kind of struggles that we hear of, you know, I'm having trouble building my software on the system. I have a bunch of dependencies that I need to get and I'm having trouble getting those installed. Um, maybe there's versions that they need, but we only support certain ones. Um, you know, all of these kind of questions are start to lead to um, containers as a, a potential um, solution to, to the issues. And another one is around this idea of being able to kind of re-execute the same, the same application or have the same environment available over a really long period of time. So in a lot of uh, domains, they may need to you know, kind of maintain that execution environment for, for years for kind of reproduce, reproducibility reasons and containers can play a role in that. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Um, and so for containers in science, why I think they're interesting is one is this productivity aspect. So the ability, you know, I can, when I create the image, I can choose what base OS I want. If there's a, an OS that already has uh, the, the pack, you know, packages available for my application, then that makes it a lot easier for me to kind of get up and running. The other thing is, is once I've built an image or if somebody else from the project has built an image, they can just share that with me and I can just reuse the same thing. So I don't have to go into my environment, try to build up the same things. I can just, uh, you know, we can share those across uh, a collaboration, for example. Another is reproducibility. Uh, you know, because everything's kind of packaged up in that environment and it's kind of encapsulated inside that image, it means that, uh, you know, even if aspects of the system change, that image is going to stay the same. And so that can make uh, it easier to reproduce those results later in time. And then also portability is uh, I can take an image and as long as it's kind of architecturally compatible, I can potentially run that image across, you know, a lot of different uh, resources. So I can take the same image and runtime and run that, you know, at NERSC or I could run it at you know, tack on Stampede, for example. Um, you know, so why users would like containers, why it's helpful to them is for many of the reasons I just alluded to. So it gives them more flexibility and power. They're not dependent on, say, a nurse staff member to go in and install something. They can address it themselves. And they can pick the OS, perhaps, that their uh, collaboration is already kind of baselined on and has created packages for, for example. Uh, and in many cases, I'll talk about some examples where it can actually improve application performance in sort of a surprising way. And like I said, things like reproducibility and sharing. 
So now just briefly talk a little bit about containers at NERSC. And so specifically, I'm going to sort of talk about Shifter and STEM. Um, so first off, why not just run Docker? Uh, we've sort of shown, you know, in the earlier slides how easy it is to build these things and then and then run run these images. The primary reason that we have not allowed Docker uh, to date has been around security. So in Docker, it's kind of an all or nothing security model. So once you have the rights to, to run Docker, then it's trivial for you to kind of escalate, use that to get more uh, privileges on the host system. So for a shared environment like Nurse, that would be a non-starter. We can't allow, you know, I show an example here where they can start to manipulate um, things in the, uh, the host system but this also means that they could get access to others users data they could you know they could delete things uh, you know obviously this would be very dangerous there's been some advancements in this space but this is still kind of um, mostly where docker is these days another is uh, system architecture docker is really designed around local disk uh, and if you um, on our systems we don't have that and so you need some ways to deal with that really want it to integrate and play well with our batch system since we that's really the th key piece that's managing access to the systems and trying to uh, make sure that how they use the resources is the correct way and then there's some other things too around complexity and system requirements i would say the system requirements are less of an issue these days but when we first started uh, developing shifter it was a serious uh, constraint so this led us to develop uh, Shifter. This was back in 2015. We'd actually had done some exploration using a, kind of a thin wrapper around Docker directly on um, Carver. Uh, but we so we saw the value of it, but we felt like uh, we we saw some weaknesses in it too, and we wanted to be able to run those on our our really large HPC systems, our Cray systems. Uh, so that would have been like uh, Hopper at the time, I think. And so we. Um, this led us to uh, start developing Shifter. So this was primarily Doug and I that, that started this. And our goal here was we wanted to leverage as much of the Docker ecosystem as possible. So especially the parts around building images and distributing images, but just customize the runtime to be more HPC friendly. And so we wanted to make sure it addressed these security issues, but it also was uh, scalable and could get native application performance. So we wanted to make sure that uh, you know, it was done in such a way that you it would be amenable to HPC type application. So the, you know, what does it look like to use Shifter um, with an, in a job? It's pretty straightforward. You can just specify what image you want to use as part of the your batch script, for example. And then when you run the application, you still would use S run. But really all it is is you just do shifter in your app, the path to your application, you know, arguments, everything else after that is pretty much the same as it would be on any, you know, when you're running any application. Uh, so your the process that you do is you use the shifter IMG command to pull that image down. What that actually does is it, it pulls it from the registry it unpacks it and then it repacks it in a way that's um, kind of optimized for our you know, our large systems. So it creates a, a single uh, image uh, out on the scratch file system and that gets mounted up at runtime. So this is why we're able to get really fast scalable launch with, uh, with Shifter. And then you just submit it. You can also specify the image as at kind of either in the submission or kind of on the command line as well. Um, and there's the advantage of the first one is it's, uh, it does all that image prep before the job, uh, before it hands control over to the job script. So everything's already in place. So that makes launch a little more uh, scalable. And then we've we've also with Shifter uh, figured out how to integrate and support MPI applications in a clean way. So what the recipe that we um, that we recommend for people developing images is that they take a stock version of, of mPitch, of you know, a fairly recent version, and then um, they build that just like they, as normal inside that, uh, inside that image. And then when we run that, that image uh, in a container with Shifter on, say, Cori, uh, 
we automatically at runtime without them doing anything, we bring in the, the MPI libraries that are optimized for the Cray network. So like the Aries uh, and pitch drivers. And so they automatically transparently get, you know, sort of native performance for that application. Uh, so th this is kind of the model that we've followed from the beginning and we've seen applications, we've seen some little hiccups that we've had to address, but we have applications that we, or images that we've uh, created back in 2015, I think, or 2016, something like that, that we are still able to run those today. Um, so I think that shows that, you know, like demonstrating at least the sum of that kind of longevity that we want to provide. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if the exposure of the MPI libraries and the way that you did that is something that, or have you, did you have to do something special for MPI or is it done in a way that allows you to sort of access whatever um, libraries are present on the, um, on Cray's, Cray Linux? What it does is um, we basically kind of package those libraries in a specific space on the system. And then Shifter has a concept that its own kind of module concept in it. And for a given module, it basically will mount those libraries into the container environment that it creates. And then it manipulates the LD library path so those get picked up instead of the ones that were in the container itself or in the image itself. And we can do that for other applic you know, other frameworks or tools as well. So this is similar to what we do for the GPU support as, as well. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we first started developing Shifter, we really the focus was on um, kind of improving productivity, making it easier for people to bring in applications to the systems than it would be otherwise. But because of the way we kind of did this um, unpacking and repacking and mounting on the compute nodes, we also discovered that it had a, a pleasant side effect that it improved some kind of perverse uh, use cases that uh, that we had encountered on the system. So one of those being Python. So when you look at what Python does when you launch it, um, it first has to walk and sort of create a namespace of all the libraries and modules that it has access to. And so that's a very metadata intensive operation because it has to walk through all the different packages to build that up. And every Python process has to do that. So if you're running tens of thousands of Python processes, all of them are doing this. It could require looking up thousands of files to you know, get that information. And, um, and that's all going back to say, the Lustre metadata server, for example. Because we take that image and we pack it up, it's just, it, it can all be kind of uh, handled locally on that node. So it doesn't, it just can look inside its cache uh, on that node to do all this metadata lookups. And so that's when we see, you know, sort of the best, it's typically uh, shifter or some, you know, these kind of packed image models. It, we, this approach has been so successful that, you know, Cray has even kind of integrated aspects of it into their own system image management approach. And I should point out that the way shifter does it is also similar that singularity uses the same model uh, as well. Uh, just to show that uh, containers aren't just for the small scale stuff. Um, one example we have, this is from a few years back, but it's still one of the more interesting ones that really illustrates containers can help uh, at scale. This was a CMB, a cosmic microwave background simulation run uh, that was done by Ted Kisner. And they had a milestone around doing these simulations that they needed to meet. And at first they were just trying to run this. This is a Python application, but then it called a lot of other optimized uh, libraries underneath the hood. So it was, you know, it was tuned for HPC, but they were having this issue with exactly with the, I was talking about with the Python uh, startup. So by switching all that to use Shifter, they were able to get their launch times down to, you know, a minimal overhead. And it was really the key between them being able to achieve their milestones. 
and they had this added benefit that now they have an image that you know is a little more portable and uh, they can go back to over time. Uh, this, this analysis was actually done by others, but it's a good illustration of sort of the different, um, most of the container usage at NERSS to date has been dominated by the experimental uh, and community, data analysis community, especially high energy physics. Um, I will say that, and we've seen a growth from, you know, a percent back in 2014 to sort of the six to eight percent. I, I was looking at this just recently to see what the numbers are at. And they're sort of in that range at present. I will say that this only captures jobs that will specify the image as part of their batch submission. So if they're using the command line to pick the image, then we, we don't currently have a way to capture that. So that's one of my to-do items is to figure out how to uh, glean additional information. So this six to eight percent is kind of a lower bound. Um, it could potentially be higher. It's, it's almost certainly higher, just don't know how much. And to date, we've seen something in the neighborhood of 7,000 unique images and over 900 unique users that have, you know, at least run Shifter at least once. Uh, you may have also uh, heard about spin. So this is just to explain the difference between shifter and spin. So shifter is about running HPC jobs. So things that kind of have, they need to run for a period of time and finish. And spin is really about running what we call edge services, but maybe think of it as uh, services that either people are gonna access from outside of NERSC, uh, things like science gateways or portals as well as um, services that maybe HPC jobs are gonna interact with. So that could potentially be things like databases or it could be workflow uh, engine services or API services that um, the HPC job may kind of interact with. Uh, so, you know, shifter for H, you know, compute intensive, time limited sort of applications and spend for things that need to be more kind of persistent, uh, you know, run all the time kind of thing. And, uh, you know, they, they're going to do a whole talk or Corey could do a whole talk and has done whole talks just on, on spin, but uh, that we've seen a, a really good uptake in, in the use of spin. I think there's something like a hundred different uh, services uh, stacks that are running in spin today. And they span a variety of different domains from, you know, things like the materials project that are, doing these pre-calculations and serving up, um, you know, material compounds that are relevant to things like batteries to uh, JGI has lots of services running in it. There's plenty from the uh, astronomy community as well. So anyway, it's been very successful. And we're in the process of moving that from a Rancher 1 system to a Rancher 2 system, which starts to bring in Kubernetes, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So just, uh, you know, sort of a snapshot of some of the efforts that were around containers going on right now at NERSC. One is uh, we're involved in the ACP Super Containers Project. I'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. We're looking at ways to have Shifter require less privilege to be able to execute or looking at alternatives to Shifter that would do the same thing. We are still doing, you know, small incremental improvements to Shifter. So for example, we just did some, some fixes to make it um, better support some of the newer image standards that we've run into. And I kind of alluded to this, we're looking at some potential you know, alternatives uh, for the future. One of those is Podman. And I'll say a little bit more about that later, but this is maybe one way that we could allow people to build images sort of on-prem at NERSC, which has been one request that we've seen. And I talked about the move with Spin to go into Rancher 2. So we're in the process of uh, onboarding new users and migrating users to, to Rancher 2. I've got a few slides on reproducibility and the role of containers there. These are, I gave a, a talk at a reproducibility workshop at ECMWF, and so I thought it'd be interesting to share some of those um, points from that. So, kind of to start with, let's just talk about ways that we see reproducibility fail. And here I'm really talking about computational reproducibility. Um, so one form is just me trying to do my own work. Um, maybe I've done something in the past and I want to reproduce those results. 
And the things that can get in my way are maybe something on the system changed and that broke my application. I may go to try to recompile it or build it and they, you know, the codes, something stops working. Maybe the compiler changed and now that build doesn't succeed. I might have trouble finding prerequisites that, uh, you know, available when I previously did it, you know, or the system doesn't even exist. Um, and then if you start to do that for somebody else's code, maybe I'm trying to reproduce somebody else's work. You know, it gets even more complicated because, you know, I might not be able to figure out how to gather the software that they did. Maybe, again, it may not be available. Versions might not have been very well captured or documented, and which can also cause problems. I may not have access to the data. I may not have access to the right kind of systems for it. So containers uh, clearly can't address all of that, but I want to talk about some of them that they do. So these are kind of this is not necessarily comprehensive, but some of the different, you know, variables that can impact reproducibility. So it can go from the very bottom kind of base level of the hardware on up to, you know, closer to how you're running the application and application characteristics. And um, these are the ones that in green and yellow that containers can start to help address. So they can capture things like the operating system, libraries, compilers, tools, the app itself, obviously. Um, things about the environment that it needs to execute in, like the environment variables. And depending, it can also help with some of the runtime characteristics or data and inputs too. Clearly there's other things that it can't help address. So just a kind of a visual of that same thing, but maybe present a slightly different uh, way. You know, these are sort of the layers of uh, the stack and where the container sort of fits into things. And, um, you know, some of the variables that I alluded to before that can start to impact things. The container, you know, again, has the Linux distribution, libraries, tools, all of those things can be uh, encapsulated in the image. And so that's how it can sort of help to address some of the, the reproducibility issues. And, that still means that you need to follow good practices in how you perhaps create your, your images. So this one is trying to show some of the best practices that you would want to kind of keep in mind. Um, one is making sure that, you know, you're starting with base images that have well-defined kind of versions and hopefully are not changing. So um, just like pulling from master on a GitHub release, there's tagged versions and you want to use those tagged versions where possible. When you're installing packages, you want to specify what versions to use as much as possible. And uh, the other things is you can set up uh, environment variables and other characteristics to make sure that the behavior somewhat, when someone else runs it, is more likely to repeat your own experience. Uh, you know, but just to point out, you know, that these image reproducibility is only as good as the weakest link. So the minute you start saying, pull something from uh, get repo that's not tagged or well managed, you, you have the potential that if somebody tries to rebuild that image later, they may fall, uh, they may hit some issues. One thing you can do is treat the image itself as an artifact and maybe um, and tag that image and kind of don't touch it afterwards. And there are even some registries that can provide some tooling or some uh, controls to prevent you from doing that so that you can uh, make sure that that's a, a kind of a durable uh, entity that you can reference later on. People are even starting to do things like put DOIs on these images so that they're really, um, you know, there's this digital identifier uh, just like you would do for a publication, for example. So that was very quick kind of re uh, uh, advantages of containers. I want to talk about some other related efforts out there. Um, so this is a bit of a hodgepodge. So it's a potpourri for a, a thousand, I guess. Um, so first off, I mentioned the super containers project earlier. Um, this is really focused on making sure that containers uh, are a kind of a first class citizen of the Excel systems and making sure that we're kind of looking at best practices and other things you need to do around the applications to make them work well in containerized deployments. So 
parts of those have been things like documenting best practices. We've been offering training uh, through things like SC tutorials, ECP summit tutorials, um, and we've done some at ISC as well. Also, we're trying to build up a set of base kind of reference images that show kind of some of these best practices and demonstrate uh, some level of portability. Uh, a related effort from that is E4S, uh, which is the kind of the SDK for the ECP software pieces that are being developed. Um, so there's a lot of other, this is, it's a very, it's a SPAC kind of based distribution for the ECP software. Uh, there are other aspects of this. This is not just purely focused on containers, but containers are one component of that. And so they have images that they're creating that have sort of all the prerequisites and uh, spec sort of set up for the E4S uh, software. And we're starting to work up on best practices where you, you can have a Docker, I meant to include a, an example of this. You have Docker files that basically are using the spec builds from E4S to make it easier for you to create your full application environment for a, inside a container. Um, you know, long-term what we wanna get to is also integrating this into CI pipelines. And so we don't, I don't think we have fully end-to-end -end solutions just yet. And this slide came from Andrew Young, who's at Sandia. So that's the reason it mentions air gap networks, which maybe is not as important for, for NURSE. But the, putting that aside, the other pieces are pretty relevant. You know, we want people to be able to have a repo for their application that as part of a CI process, it's doing all the building and testing, but part of that is also building up images, potentially for different architectures. And then those images could easily be uh, pulled down and run on you know, the future exas exascale systems or even the pre-exascale systems uh, like Perlmutter. Uh, so that was sort of some of the ECP related things. Another couple of points I wanted to talk about is where we're seeing containers used as part of workflows as well. And so there are some good examples of these standardized workflow descriptions that have emerged, things like CWL and WDL, uh, where th that standard of how you express your workflow is, is maintained as an open kind of standard with a community behind it. And then there are tools that can implement those standards. Uh, what's interesting, uh, they're starting to integrate containers directly into the specification. So as part of that description, you might say, I need, you know, I would need to run this task and this is the image I want to run it in and, you know, the other arguments and whatever that I need to use when executing that task. And this again, you know, alluding back to the reproducibility aspect, this makes it easier uh, to get the same results, but also makes it more portable, which is a key kind of uh, goal of these, of these things. And they can even do things where they capture that as part of the provenance of once you've executed a workflow. So they can say like, I know exactly what version of the container I used. And you can even do things where you rerun, if you try to rerun uh, the same inputs, it can notice that I've already done that and it can kind of skip through things, for example. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is there's a growing number of uh, repositories and sort of optimized uh, images that are starting to appear. So two examples are the biocontainers um, repository. So this has a lot of images for the bio community. And then NVIDIA has their own registry where they've already gone and optimized uh, applications for GPUs, you know, using CUDA, or this would also include things like machine learning, deep learning framework. So you'll find optimized versions of say TensorFlow in there. Uh, so I think this starts to get towards one of the value propositions that were made for images is you can start to have communities creating these rather than sort of individuals having to do it on their own. And, uh, you know, that the person that best knows how to do that optimized version of it can take care of it and everybody else can kind of reap the benefits of it. So I think that's clearly sort of the case with uh, 
for example, the NVIDIA containers. All right, and then um, just uh, to talk a little bit about sort of future directions uh, for things sort of container relevant. So one is um, Kubernetes. I've mentioned, kind of alluded to it um, previously. So, you know, this is not a distant thing. We are going to have at least Kubernetes under the hood in, our, in, in Perlmutter. So it's part of the Cray Shasta um, software system. And uh, if you look at the, you know, I was trying to be careful to make sure I didn't say anything that wasn't public. So this comes off of their webpage and you can see them clearly talking about wanting to run these kind of converged HPC and AI workflows. So clearly this is, um, you know, it's on Cray's mind. I think it's on other vendors are also trying to capitalize on this. And I'll talk a little bit about why, why this is happening in a few slides. So I think initially this is really gonna be uh, how much of this is visible to the end user uh, early on on Permutter, I think is probably gonna be minimal at first, but over time I expect we're gonna be looking at ways to expose more of those capabilities. Um, but this is something that we ourselves are gonna to have to, to learn. Uh, just some humor on Kubernetes, since I think a lot of people have probably heard it, but maybe it's not clear what, what it is exactly. Um, I like this, somebody mentioned this quote in a workshop I was, a virtual workshop I was attending this week. This one time I tried to explain Kubernetes to someone, then we both didn't understand it. Um, but really what, if you go look up, you know, Wikipedia, it's an open source container orchestration system for automating deployment and scaling and managing applications. Um, it, it is very tailored. It was developed initially by Google. It is really designed around things like supporting web services, but it's pretty flexible and you're seeing extended well beyond that. Um, if you like writing YAML, then you'll love Kubernetes because that's really how everything's kind of expressed. This is just an example of like what a, a Kubernetes YAML file might look like. And you see these kind of patterns repeated throughout. So there are different, you know, kind of spec files that you need to generate and feed into Kubernetes. And then it'll use those to basically generate the state of, for the services that you're describing. But the idea here is everything that you need to know about how to deploy that um, application, for example, is captured inside these specifications. Um, so why is Kubernetes interesting for HPC? Um, I think right now it's, it's still an emerging thing, but where I th think we're heading is that you'll, you'll start to see examples where um, say somebody wants to run some application and maybe there's other services that they need to, to start up as part of that larger workflow. And so that may be one place where you start to see that occur. Another thing that we're already seeing is that these two, these second and third bullet points are somewhat related. We're starting to see tools that like, they come from maybe the cloud space. So they've already designed it around Kubernetes. And so that's just becoming sort of a, common language that is being used. And if we want to be able to leverage that, then we need to be able to kind of integrate that into our systems. And then you, we are starting to see other kind of um, tooling, workflow tools, things like that, that are layered on top of Kubernetes. And again, if we want to be able to provide those to our users, then we need to be able to integrate those into the system. So there, for example, things like Argo, which I'll show a few uh, examples of in just a bit that could be a nice way for people to express their workflows, maybe even better in certain ways than some of the examples I showed before. And, but there are a lot of different frameworks that we're starting to see that, that use that. So just briefly an example of Argo. Argo probably is one example of something that looks more familiar, something like that we're used to with something like Slurm. So it has concepts like submitting jobs and listing them and managing them. Uh, so it's somewhat a familiar kind of conceptual model that we're, we're used to. And the specification, it's again a YAML kind of model, but it's maybe a little less complicated than the ones we saw with kind of native Kubernetes. So I think that, you know, whether it's Argo or something else, I think you will see 
these higher level tools that layer on top of Kubernetes maybe provide a, a you know, language or syntax that's really optimized for particular use cases and it makes it easier for users to kind of get their, their work done. And then, you know, this is just showing when you submit jobs to Argo, it kind of, if you, you know, if you've used Slurm, this looks, uh, looks somewhat familiar. All right, and the last thing I just wanted to finish with is talk about, um, you, I, I didn't say much about it. I've talked about the different run times. I think, um, you know, the problem with having sort of these HPC specific run times is it, it kind of sets us apart from the broader container and kind of cloud container community. And um, I think ultimately it'd be, it'd be best if that were not the case. And so what would an ideal HPC runtime look like? So one is, is you know, we are worried about security. Um, the less privileges that uh, these runtimes have, then the less worried we have to be about some, you know, bug in the system that could be exploited, for example. So to the extent that they could have no special privileges, this, is, this would be an improvement. We still don't want to give up on things like scalability. So we want to be able to scale to thousands of nodes um, and you know, be sort of exascale ready. We want them to be able to exploit interconnects and accelerators you know, as much as possible and as portable a way as possible. And again, we'd like them to be closely aligned with the broader uh, ecosystem because that means we're able to more quickly leverage maybe innovations that are coming from, say, outside the HPC world right and so i would argue that podman i'm starting to see show some signs of of that so i'm very interested in i've been sort of tracking this i'm curious to see how it emerges we are going to explore it first as a place to just provide probably um build utilities for uh, nurse users we're going to start with nurse staff but probably expand it out but what's interesting about it is it's it's kind of part of the normal cloud stack. So it's not this sort of distant cousin. It's designed to be a drop-in replacement for Docker. Um, so you can actually alias Podman uh, for Docker and or you can do like alias Docker equals Podman and you could, to first order, you don't see any differences. Um, and it's actually able to run with no special privileges. So that's the big win to date. Uh, and it's got active developers but with Red Hat being the primary developer of it and Sousa I think is also involved. So that it still is, it's starting to address some of the, the gaps, but we still need this issue of scalable launch address and also clean ways to leverage interconnects and accelerators. I think it's looking pretty encouraging. And so that's something we're actually exploring actively right now. All right, so just a few um, summary points. Uh, They've, I would argue they've already become a critical enabling tool for HPC, mainly for these kind of productivity and reproducibility reasons. Um, and we're starting to see you know, this growing ecosystem of tools outside of HPC, but we're starting to see those um, become you know, pulled into our environments. And I think that you know, this is only gonna continue. And my question, I even asked this at the workshop is like, do we think we'll be at a point in time in the not too distant future where all applications that run on our HPC systems are containerized, whether the user knows it or not? And it could be that even with Perlmutter, we have some level of truth to it. So that was that was it. I'll be happy to take any uh, any questions. Thank you.